Hello and welcome to another episode of the Changing Minds podcast. My name is Owen Fitzpatrick and I'm very excited today to be joined by somebody that I just met recently, but we had a wonderful conversation and I knew that every one of you will get a massive amount from listening to him. This is actually someone that, while I didn't know it at the time, I came across him a number of years ago in a viral video and we're going to get into that very, very quickly. But it's a viral video, which is one of the most inspirational things I've ever seen. So I'm very excited for my guest to talk to us about that. My guest is Jim Johnson. He's renowned for a remarkable journey in the world of high school basketball. Uh, joining us from Rochester in New York, Coach Johnson brings with him a legacy of over 30 years in coaching, where he transforms struggling basketball teams into winning champions. His career boasts an impressive 428 victories, but it's his heartwarming actions in 2006 that we're going to talk about soon that truly capture the essence of his character, an incredible story that went viral. Beyond the court, Coach Johnson's influence is far-reaching. He was named Coach of the Year in 2006 uh, and received a National Sportsmanship Award, underscoring his profound impact in shaping character through sport. His career is highlighted by numerous titles and a consistent record of successes, solidifying his success and status as a coaching legend. Now retired from his roles in coaching and teaching, Coach Johnson focuses on sharing his experiences and insights through keynotes such as Dreams Really Do Come True and Leadership Lessons from Half Court. Based on his vast experience and focus on crucial themes such as teamwork, goal setting and exemplary leadership for dozens of organizations across the country. Very wonderful for you to be joining us. Thanks so much, Jim, for taking the time out to be on the Change Your Minds podcast. My pleasure, Owen. I'm looking forward to it. So let's start with the, again, when I first heard about you was based upon this incredible story. Could you set the scene for us? When was this? This was 2006. Walk us through what happened and how it changed your life and in particular the life of one very special young man. Sure. So I got to take you back a few years before that because he came into our program. His name was Jason McElwain. Actually, I had a very d uh, difficult time pronouncing his last name. So I actually tagged him the nickname J-Mac and he liked it. Now <laughs> It's a global name that a lot of people know. So I got to laugh about that. But Jason came into our program as a sophomore in high school and he tried out for our junior varsity. I was the head coach. I was the varsity coach. And after a few days of trials, I had not known Jason, even though I was a physical education teacher at the school, I had not had him in class. So my JV coach came to me and said, coach, we have a young man. He has this big heart. He's not a very good player. He's not a very good athlete. And he, he has a lot of challenges. He's on the autism spectrum, but he has a lot of the other ingredients. We've talked about the type of people we want in our program. He's a we over me guy. He's got a great work ethic. He, he's passionate about basketball. I think we should keep him in the program. I said, well, what do you got in mind? So I'd like to have him serve as our team manager, but I'm going to let him practice with the team he's seeing. And that's what he did. And so I just got to know Jason a little bit. I did tag him the nickname during a practice one day when I walked in and, and he liked it, fortunately. But where I got to know him a little bit his sophomore year is because the JV and varsity played back to back most nights. So Jason would sit on the bench. I'd say sit and not all the time. He was pretty emotional because he was really behind the team. But he also wanted to sit on the bench for the varsity game where he was much more calm because he, he didn't know the varsity players as well. In fact, it did warm my heart, though, because after the JV game, he would often be what I call a tad disheveled from being so emotional. And to see one of our varsity players walk over and straighten out his white shirt and black tie and get him ready for the varsity game was pretty cool. So I was starting to get to know him. But where I really got to know him was after his sophomore season, he started to come to all our offseason workouts, which was very very unique for me, Owen, because I was a head coach for 30 years and I could count on one hand of a, a young man because I was a boys basketball coach that if they didn't make the team would try out the next year. And if they did try out, which was very rare, they did it in a half-hearted action. They wouldn't uh, come to off-season workouts, but Jason was different. In fact, I started to pick him up from his house and I just love this guy's passion. We were talking basketball all the time. So he tries out for the varsity, the team I coach as a junior, and he doesn't make it, but I asked him to serve as our team manager. And at that point in my career, I had been fairly successful. If you measure wins and losses, we had a lot of winning seasons, but we had a big stumbling block. And I think for your listeners, we all have that really stumbling block we don't seem we can get, get through and for me it was we wanted to win our first section five championship which we'd never won under my direction 
And Jason uh, quickly embraced his manager's role. In fact, at our first team meeting, he says, coach, he raises his hand. He goes, I know you've never won a section five championship. And I said, well, thanks, Jason, for the reminder. And he said, but this year is going to be different. We're embracing this mantra, stay focused, and we're going to help you win your first section five championship. I said, well, thank you, Jason. Well, he was a great loyal to our team. We got to the semifinals now for the sixth time in my career, and we lose at the buzzer to our crosstown rival. And I am devastated. Oh, and I don't know, you know, for people that are listening and thinking, you know, you get that barrier. Are you ever going to get through it? But Jason was my inspiration because, again, he came at all our offseason workouts and really wanted to make the team as a senior. Well, we had almost everybody coming back. So I knew the odds of him making the team were very low. And when he tried out his senior, I brought him in. I said, Jason, unfortunately, you're not quite good enough to be on the team. And you could tell he's visibly disappointed because he put a lot of time and energy and but I said, I want to give you a gift this year. And the gift is for senior night, our final home game. I'm going to put you in uniform and hopefully get you in the game. And I kid people that periodically they ask me about that uniform during the season. And of course, I define periodically as about every other day. <laughs> it was pretty pumped up. Well, I actually wrote a book about it, and I'll get into the game in just a moment called A Coach and a Miracle. The really the, this was the most unique season. Certainly because of what I'm going to share with Jason's game. But the other part was the first half of the year was the most difficult season I ever had in my entire life. We were really divided over an issue and it was really difficult. In fact, I nearly resigned. Uh, so, but my assistant coaches and my wife kept saying, you know, you always give them quotes like the fact that when the going gets tough, the tough get going, it's time for you to step up. So I embraced the challenge, but it was not easy. But finally we got things going and we got some momentum going into senior night. So senior night was on February 15th of 2006. I gave him his first uniform on February 13th. In fact, there was a rumor going around school that he slept in it for two straight nights. <laughs> he was pretty fired up. Well, senior night, for our listeners that are familiar, that's our final home game. And we honor all the seniors. We bring their parents or guardians out before the game. And it's always very special. But this was profoundly special. To see J-Mac, instead of in his white shirt and black tie, he's now Donnie number 52. Let me just enter there just for a second. Sure. What about the rest of the team? What was their relationship like with J-Mac? It was really good. And, and you really get a, even a better picture of when I answer that question. Great question. When I share about what happened in the game. So the kids, because we had a lot of issues, but Jason was kind of the rock because he didn't completely understand the issues like, you know, pretty much everybody else did. But he was just so enthusiastic. And, you know, he was still that goal. We're going to win our section by championship. So after three quarters of the game, I get everybody in but Jason. So my goal was I wanted to get him in with enough time so he could score a basket. I thought if he could score a basket, that's a memory he'll cherish for the rest of his life. So with about four minutes to go, I put him in. The place exploded. And what was really cool that really touched me deeply was when I he walked on the floor for the first time. Our student body, they called themselves a six man. They gave him a standing ovation. But what was really cool, one of our parents had made these pictures of Jason's face and put them on paint sticks like placards. And they showed those placards. Well, Jason and I had no idea they were doing that. So I got so overwhelmed with emotion. Here's the head coach. I'm sitting down and tears are rolling down my face. I'm profoundly touched. The game begins. First time we get the ball, one of his teammates throws Jason the ball in the right corner behind the three-point line. He lets a three-pointer grow. The crowd stands with anticipation. It misses by like six feet. And I kid people, I know you're not supposed to pray in the public schools, but I was praying, dear God, please help him get one basket. Well, the next possession, I guess God was starting to listen because he had a much shorter shot. This time it was about 10 feet. And this time it hit the rim, but it fell off. But I'm like, all right, we're getting closer. Third shot is a three-pointer from the right wing. And this time, magic. The place explodes. I'm thinking God must be a basketball fan. Not only has Jason scored, he's got a three-pointer. I can't even better than this, right? Wrong. Well, for the next three minutes, I, I'm going to give you a quick fast forward and then come back and finish the story. Jason's idol was the late Kobe Bryant. For your listeners, he was one of the greatest NBA players of all time, played for the Lakers. And Jason, five months after that game, 
uh, is up for an ESPY, which is the kind of the Oscars for sports, for the best sports moment of the year. And one of the other four finalists was his idol, Kobe Bryant. Kobe had scored 81 points in an NBA game. So he meets his idol and he beats him out for the ESPY. Well, how does he do that? Well, after that first three he comes back down, he makes another three. Then he makes a shot where actually his foot is on the line, so he gets two. Then he makes a couple, he misses it, and the place is just going bananas. And the two things I'll never forget was about a minute ago, I'm sitting on the bench, tears still flowing down my face. I can't believe what I'm seeing. And I get a tap on my shoulder. I'm shocked. I look behind me. It's Jason's mother. She's bawling her eyes out, and she whispers in my ear, Coach, this is the best gift you could ever give my son. What would you have done if you heard that, Owen? I cried harder. And then this is how the game ends. It's like out of a Hollywood movie is that with about 10 seconds to go, our opponent spent support. And I want to give kudos to their coach and their players. They're really good sports. And they score a basket and our player that takes it out of bounds normally throws it to our point guard. But this time he throws the J-Mac. So J-Mac's dribbling down the court and, and the clock's ticking down six, five. I'm thinking they're just going to let him go in. He's going to have a short layup and finish the game. Oh, no, he pulls up like two feet behind the arc, almost at a May three. I'm thinking, Jason, don't shoot from there. You're going to ruin the moment. He launches this rainbow swish. I look over, our student body runs on the floor. All our players run on the floor. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm living the movie Rudy, but this is really true. Uh, and then the players put them up on their shoulders. And I'll never forget it, because at this point, I had no idea how many points it scored. And our public address announcer comes on and says, a leading scorer for the Trojans tonight, J-Mac, with 20 points, including six three-pointers in about three minutes. Because he got in with four, but he didn't score his baskets almost three minutes. But to answer your question, to tell you what the kids felt about him, I had never asked the four players to pass Jason the ball. Yet out of their own hearts, they decided to pass him the ball on every possession. In fact, I still kid in this day, Jason, I'm still looking for your first assist. You didn't pass the ball once. Uh, but that gives you an idea how much the kids love Jason. Incredible, incredible story. And yeah, very, very touching and very, very emotional. Um, he went on to meet the president, did that right? And he also did something else that was insanely remarkable as well when it comes to running. Yeah, so we actually, I had the privilege to meet President Bush with Jason and his parents. That was really cool. He came uh, to Rochester, I don't think just to meet us, but he did come and we did uh, have the privilege to meet him. And then I uh, actually, I'll tell you two quick things and I'll share that remarkable thing that you're leading to is that so... The interesting part is we had never won that Section 5 championship. And Jason, three weeks later, was back as our team manager in, in front of a crowd of 10,000 people. Normally uh, in our area, we, I'm from Rochester, New York, we play an arena that has about 10,000. But normally for a championship game, we'll get four or 5,000. It's sold out because of, of the media attention we were getting. And we won our first Section 5 championship when we rallied late in the game and, and won in the last 30 seconds. So it was a pretty cool thing. And then after that, Owen, what you're leading to is a couple of years, he was out of our program, graduated from high school. He's working at a local grocery store, Wegmans, for the people that know that it's big in New York and some other states. But he came back one day in my office and says, coach, I really miss the program. I would like to come back and help you in some way. And I said, sure. So he was my volunteer assistant. And we ended up uh, winning five more championships together. So I kid people that for a small fee, we'll run him out to you. He's certainly my good luck charm. Well, which, the story you were leading to that was really amazing is Jason was also a runner in high school. But just to give everybody a perspective, in that game, he was about 5'9", 120 pounds. He had a growth spurt after, and right now, if you met, met him today, he's 6'2", about 170. He couldn't bench press 75 pounds his senior year in high school. He bench presses over 250 now, so he's certainly much stronger. But about four or five years into working with me, he comes in the office one day. He says, Coach, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to coach. And I said, yeah, Jason, it's great to have you every day. And he says, but I miss being competitive myself. I'm going to get back into running. And I said, really? What are you going to do? He says, I'm going to run the Rochester Marathon. And I, you know, I always worked with my players a lot with goals. I said, well, what's your goal? He says, coach, 
I want to qualify for the Boston Marathon. Now, I have not run a marathon, but I've run enough where I know qualifying times. And I said, Jason, don't they have qualifying times for the Boston Marathon? He goes, yeah, for my age, I got to run it in under three hours and five minutes. Now, for your audience that are are not marathon runners, believe me, that is a very fast marathon. And so he runs his first Rochester Marathon three hours, one minute and 30 seconds. So he qualifies for Boston. The crazy part of the story is he comes to me a couple of weeks later. He says, coach, I want to prove it to myself one more time. So he doesn't run that next year when he could have. And the ironic thing that was when they had the bombing that he could have been there. So he ends up run, rerunning the Rochester Marathon, runs it this time in three hours and like 46 seconds. And he qualifies this time he's going. So I met with him. I said, Jason, so what's your goal for Boston? He says, I'm going to break three hours. I said, Jason, Boston's a tougher course than Rochester. He's got heartbreak hill. He goes, I know I've upgraded my training. (laughs) First Boston marathon, two hours, 58 minutes and 42 seconds. Insane. Yeah. Again, as you mentioned it there, Jim, anyone who knows anything about marathons knows Breaking, I mean, look, breaking four hours is a great achievement for anyone. Yes. You know, I did the marathon once before, but I was much younger. If I managed to break four hours now at my age, I'd be over the moon. That that would be my goal, just to break right. four to yeah, break yeah. three hours. Yeah. It's insane. That's yeah. an incredible achievement. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Yeah, he just never stops to cease his amazement. Are you still in touch to this day? We are, yeah. We text almost every single day. It's funny, you know, because I started speaking on the side, you know, because I coached for 10 more years after that game. And he was on my side for eight years. And I remember, you know, I would travel out of town. They say, do you ever see him? I said, see him? (laughs) Yeah, I'm with him almost every single day. And the days I'm not with him, he texts me like 10 times and calls me. Yeah, Um, he still lives in our town and I still talk to him quite a bit, so. So as you mentioned, you've retired now, but you learned a lot of lessons along your journey as a coach. Would love to understand, I, I know you do a lot in terms of teaching leaders to become great leaders. Yeah. Just, just a few questions. From your own point of view, what are the best, most important qualities that you've found in leaders? It's a great point. I, I'll start with, I think, a, a couple things is they build a resume by doing consistently things well. So they build confidence. But I think the best leaders have those two qualities, the ability to be confident because they deserve it, because they work at it. But the second piece is the the ability to be humble and authentic and and be vulnerable and, and be open to that they don't have all the answers. So that would be a general overview. Two things that I talk about seven keys about being an effective leader, but I'm sure two that I think are really, really potent, not to say that they aren't all are important. But I think the first one is, I know this is an old adage, but I think there's so much truth in it. To be an effective leader, the first person you got to do is lead yourself. So when I work with leaders, one of the things I really talk to them about is getting clarity about their personal mission. Why would they put it on this earth? You know, Simon Sick wrote a great book about the power of why, right? And, and then the second piece is with developing a mission statement, which it's not something you do in five minutes. It takes some time. You've got to really get clarity. But it, I think it's got to be built about your core values, what's most important uh, in doing that, which I think will lead to developing a team mission. I'll give you an illustration. When I took over to Athena, that's when I really started to get clarity of better leading myself and also uh, having a team mission. So I'll give you an illustration of both. My mission statement is to be an outstanding role model that makes a positive difference in the world by helping others make their dreams come true. And why I think that's powerful is because we all get off track. But the key is, do you have that North Star that you leads you back to where you know that this is what I need to get back on track. So, you know, if I'm serving people and finding different ways to lead by example, then I know I'm living my mission. When I go off that track, I know I got to get back onto that. And then an illustration, our team mission, because I, I took over four programs. The first program was a disaster. They let me go after one year because we won one game. And then the, the other three we were able to turn around. And when I would ask the players about, you know, what should we be all about? They always started with, we want to win, which makes sense. You know, in business, you, you got to make a profit or you don't exist, right? But I said, it's got to be bigger than that. And, and so we developed a mission called where we wanted to develop winners on and off the court. 
And as a leader, I think you got to be the CRO, which is the chief reminding officer. You got to live the mission and you got to be sharing the mission. And that, that was my job as the coach is teaching them what it takes to be a winner on the court, certainly winning the, on the scoreboards, part of that, but also being a great teammate, how to uh, build a culture that was positive, And then off the court, being a great citizen, being the best student you could be. Those are the things we were trying to teach our players day in and day out to be a winner on and off the court. And then the second piece I'll share with you is that, and I challenge leaders, because I often ask them, is trust important in building a great team culture? And I've spoken to a lot of audiences and it's 100%. They show their hands, yes, trust. I said, well, I, do you have an intentional trust plan? And they kind of get stunned. I said, because we had a three-pronged attack. I, you know, As I said, I did a very poor job on my first coaching job, but after that, I got much more clarity. And I knew that building trust was so essential, especially because I took over three programs that were, weren't doing well. So trust is not do, going well when you go into something where it's not very successful. And so we always talk to, you know, when I taught my staff is that number one, we got to be consistently lying our words and actions. People forget that you are always on a stage as a leader and they're watching you and if you are doing one thing and saying another, that's going to come back. That's going to hurt that trust account. Number two is we really wanted to focus on sharing each other, uh, telling the truth. Now, that's where I think there's an art and science, because I don't think you can just come out and say exactly in front of the team and try to embarrass a player. I think you got to get to know your players and build relationships. Sometimes you can call out a, a player and it can be helpful, but there's often much of the time that's got to be when you're criticizing someone done one-on-one -on -one behind closed doors. And then the third piece is because we took over programs that hadn't been successful. This was the old Ken Blanchard, but I think there's so much true. We really try to focus on catching people doing right and, and really trying to build their confidence by sharing, but not only catching them doing right, but being specific. So example, you know, in my case, I'm coaching boys basketball, but I say nice job, Johnny. Well, Johnny will probably like that, but he really is clueless of why I said nice job, right? But if I say Johnny, that was awesome how you dove on the floor for that loose ball. That's what championship players do on championship teams. Now he's much more clear that that's why he got praised. That's uh, also that's also very much in line with, with the, the growth mindset, Professor Carol Dweck. It's exactly yes. that. So it's phenomenal that, you know, that intuitive approach is, you know, backed up by the literature as well. So wonderful. Yeah. Love to hear that example. Yeah. So thank you. I appreciate that. So those are, you know, I mean, we could delve in a little bit deeper with other things, but those were two that is, first of all, getting clarity and leading yourself, understanding your mission, your values, and then living them. And then the second piece is building trust. There's certainly other factors, but those are the two that jump right out to me. And so one, one other question I wanted to ask, and then we'll do a, if it's okay, a quick fire round where I ask, sure. you know, a Absolutely. bunch of questions. The one other question is, what are, a couple of other examples of questions that you think all leaders should ask for them to, you know, grow better teams and whatnot. So that's a great thing. I do a little personal leadership presentation and it's the 10 questions, all effective leaders. It's all really about your own individual, but so like one of, I know I was listening to one of your podcasts about, you know, what hurts your energy. So it kind of the, is, do you have a, a personal growth plan? All right, so are you intentional to try to get a little bit better each day? Do you have a personal wellness plan? Are you consistent? Because I think it's very hard to be an effective leader if you lack energy. And so I think those are a couple of questions that we really try to focus in. You know, going back to what I said before, do you have your own personal mission statement? I think having clarity about who and why are so important. Uh, so those would be three of the questions, uh, you know, and certainly there are a lot of great questions out there, but I think challenge yourself, as you said, you know, I love Carol Duck's book on growth mindset is the fact that, you know, do you have that growth mindset? Because, you know, the interesting thing, I'm going to get off just very quick tangent, you know, debatably, and probably it's hard to argue that probably the greatest football coach in the NFL of all time is Bill Polichek, if you go my numbers. OK, I mean, he's won six Super Bowls. That's pretty amazing. Right. But if you go with the interesting part is the last few years, 
they're really struggling. In fact, you know, there's rumors now that may, he may not be back. You know, who knows? Uh, but why I bring that up is because I, I don't know Bill Jack, but I'm wondering, has he stopped growing? You know, is he kind of said, you know, is he living on past success? Because that's a very dangerous thing, even for the best leaders, is if you don't keep growing, you tend to start to die. And, and that's when usually your team or your organization tends to die. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. And I mean, I think a lot of the things that, you know, you talked about are all about helping people to continuously grow, whether it's the leader or the leader helping their teams as well. I mean, we could talk about this forever. I, I well know, but in terms of thinking on time, I've got some questions that I like to ask all podcast guests at the end, and it's a lightning round. So just whatever comes to mind, it doesn't have sure. to be the favorite, but a favorite will do if you can't think of the favorite movie. Favorite movie, I hate to say this because, you know, I'm a big sports guy, so I really enjoyed Hoosiers, but I got to say that my favorite movie of all time is Remember the Titans. So. Oh, fantastic. The legend, Denzel Washington. What a, what a genius. Favorite TV series? Favorite TV series, my wife would yell at me because it came back and I'd say is Hawaii Five-0. <laughs> <laughs> very good. I don't hear that very often. Yeah. Um, favorite author? Favorite author is, that's another great question that I would say uh, my favorite book probably of all time is The Seven Habits by Dr. Covey. But, you know, because I love leadership, I'd say probably John Maxwell. John Maxwell. Fantastic. And the next one was book. Favorite artist? And that would be, you know, painter, sculptor, that kind of art. Uh, well, I got to be very frank with you. That, that's a real weakness for me. I, I, I don't, you know, like I admire art, but I, I can't say like, I, I would be lying to you say uh, Picasso because I mean, I've heard of I him. I know, I know. I appreciate it. And I'd be very similar. So yeah. favorite musician? Favorite musician, I'm going to have to go back to my early bringings. It would probably be, uh, group wise, it would probably be Leonard Skinner. So I'm really uh, dating myself and probably my favorite artist, uh, as a solo would be Bob Seger. Fantastic. Favorite philosopher? Is there anyone? And this could be formal philosophy or even, you know, sports philosophy, any kind of person that inspired you with their ways of thinking. No question that it would be, you know, I, I'm giving you redundant, but I'll also give you the basketball example. So certainly Stephen Covey really changed my life a lot, you know, and just the, all the things that he studied and, and shared in his various books and, and programs. And I had the blessing to speak one time to Franklin Covey, although he had just passed away. So I didn't get a chance to meet him personally, but I did meet some of his siblings, that kind of thing. And then from the basketball world, you know, Debatably, maybe the best coach of all time, John Wood, and just as I've studied him immensely, you know, and one of the things I really encourage leaders is, you know, figuring out what did the best do and how can you implement, because you can't be that, okay? Let me just give you, if you don't mind, just a quick side story. The second basketball program I took over was a small school about 30 minutes from where I grew up. And they weren't very good. It was more of a football school. But we got it going a couple of years. But the interesting sidelight is there was one coach in the league that was dominating. They, his team was winning every year. And when I went to the first coaches meeting, you could feel the friction. Everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, most of the coaches couldn't stand this guy because he was highly successful. I befriended the guy. I'm like, this guy's got to figure it out. I don't. And I ended up being good friends with him. And he taught me a lot of things and helped me immensely. So I, why I share that is because I think too often we get into this, oh, you know, jealousy or envy and learn from the best, you know, and, and pick out great ideas that they come up with and, you know, implement them in your life. Fantastic. And, and sometimes it's not even just the jealousy and envy. It's also the, I can never be like that, you know, the fixed yeah. mindset about that as well. So no, I totally agree. This is a fun one. If you could have any superpower, what would you have and why? You know, and it's funny because I've heard this question before, but you caught me off guard because I, you know, because really right now what I'm pushing for Owen is, is to have more love in the world. So it, my superpower would be is the ability to spread the love and respect for all people. Fantastic. And very much needed in today's world, as you said. Ideal, if you could travel anywhere in the past, present or future, when would you go? 
Well, on my bucket list right now, because I, I have started to open up because I'm a high school basketball coach for 35 years, as I've become an avid tennis player. And so I absolutely love tennis. I watch a lot of tennis now. So my bucket list is I, I'd like to go to Wimbledon. Okay. So would that be, in, that'd be, so if you had a time machine, would you go back to a specific time in Wimbledon? Like a game? You know, that's a good question because I certainly would be, would love to go now, but you know, cause I kind of went through different eras and I did follow tennis a little bit when I was younger, when it was the John McEnroe, Jimmy Connors, a little bit into Pete Sampras, which was, you know, when America tennis was kind of, you know, at the top right now, like we only have one American player in the top 10 in the male side. So, you know, we've kind of are a little bit behind right now in tennis perspective. So that was a cool era, you know, from the American perspective. But I think just the, you know, from everything I've heard about, and one of my former players lives in England. So that's kind of my bucket list is to go visit him and get an opportunity to go to Wimbledon. Fantastic. If you could live anywhere else in the world, where would you live? Well, for me, because we only have one son and he lives in Los Angeles, so I, we'd love to be able to live closer. You know, I don't know. I mean, we do really well here, but I mean, the house he just bought, we could get for maybe a couple hundred thousand here. And yeah. it was well over a million dollars. So we're trying to figure that out. But it, just because I'd love to be closer to my son. So, and, and I got to admit, you know, growing up in Rochester, New York, where we get more than our fair share of snow, I would be glad to get all the snow if you could have done any other career besides the one that you did what other career do you think would have suited you pretty well that's a tricky question because when i was young i wanted to actually be a division one basketball coach so i think as i've learned you know, and got in my own personal growth, I, I do really enjoy, although I don't know, you know, how I, I've figured it out, but, you know, getting into the speaking and trying to make a difference, you know, serving from that, I think is something I really enjoy. I, I wish I'd done earlier, but, it, you know, it's interesting because I think I had an opportunity to get into college basketball and it's a long story I'm not going to get into, it, but it didn't work out. And as I look back, I, I do, I'm a believer in God. And I think he was saying, you know what, the best place for you is to make an impact with high school and young men. So I feel blessed that I did have a kind of, you know, the, the career I did have. With that in mind, the very final question, Jim, what's one piece of advice, if you could put a piece of advice on a, you know, billboard for the world to hear, what would that piece of advice be? Keep growing and keep serving others. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Jim, for sharing your story of growth and serving so many people. A wonderful story about Jason and that incredible moment in 2006. Thanks for sharing the story. Thanks for all the wisdom. Definitely look forward to chatting to you again. And where can people find out more about you and get access to your books and whatnot? Sure. Yeah. So everything's pretty much on my website. I kid people. It's coachjimjohnson.com. That way I wouldn't forget it. And I, I do have a free newsletter. I have a free weekly blog. I, I do a video series and, and the book is on there as well. I'm excited that we're going to have you on later. We have a podcast called the Limitless Leadership Lounge. That It was kind of my brainchild. I worked with two other people, but you know, because my first head coaching job I lost after one year, and I realized how much people, when they get in their first leadership position, like I was, are clueless. And so that's what I really wanted to focus on this podcast. And I know you're going to be a great guest for us in getting that right mindset of how to be an effective leader. And because I think too many times we get promoted with really not the skills they need for it to be an effective leader. A hundred percent. Thank you so much for all the wisdom you've shared in our episode today. It's been super talking to you as always. So take care, be well, and all of you listeners out there, you know where you can go to find out more information about Jim. I'm sure you all, like me, have to go and try to get some tissues to wipe away some of those tears that were coming as he was sharing the beautiful story earlier. But for now, take care, be well, see you soon, and may the force, as always, be with you. Bye for now.